Will you pray with me? God of love, open our minds, awaken our hearts, and enliven our wills as we receive your gospel to us today. Amen. It is a real delight and privilege for me to be here with you this, in this pulpit, and I feel grateful and humbled. We are here on the second week of Advent, the Sunday that is in year A of the three-year lectionary cycle. So, just in case you're feeling a little deja vu, we, you and I, have been here before together. It just so happens that exactly three years ago, when these same scriptures came up in the lectionary, I was preaching in this very place. I can't help but think that maybe God thought I needed to do a do-over. So, um, depending on how today goes, we may just be meeting here again in three years. Actually, when I considered these scriptures at that time, I pretty much steered clear of John the Baptist and stuck with Isaiah. Give me the wolf lying down with the lamb, the child shall lead them in Isaiah any day over this fire and brimstone guy, John. But second time around, no more avoiding. And it just so happens that in the lectionary every year on the second Sunday of Advent, it, the gospel is on John the Baptist, whether it's in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. So obviously, the lectionary writers clearly wanted us to hear from this man, John, talking about the adult Jesus, right smack dab in the middle of this liturgical season focused on waiting and watching for the birth of Jesus. So what does that all mean for us? Well, in my preparation for today, I went through some conversations and wrestling with this prophet John and I had to deal with some of my own baggage from past religious messages, past history about this word repent that I used to hear and in some part of me still probably does that that meant I must feel really bad and sorry for my sin and promise to be a better person until the next time I sinned again and then start all over again. Basically a perspective that God loves me in spite of who I am. But what shook out in this conversation or wrestling with John for me this time is that repentance isn't about feeling bad or saying sorry but rather it's about a reorientation, a change of mind, perspective, and direction to something completely new and a commitment to live differently in that new paradigm. And we're not the only ones talking about this kind of change these days. There's a new movement in the organizational development world called Awareness-Based Systems Change. You can go to a seminar on it, and I actually think they could probably shorten their title from Awareness-Based Systems Change to Repentant Seminars. <laughs> but uh, they may not get that many people, I don't know, but I, that's my thought. Um, but maybe indeed this idea of repentance is very much about an Advent preparation for a new mind, a new perspective, a new way of being that is coming, that is being birthed, the already but not yet. So to share a personal story, um, when I first started training as a chaplain in my residency in clinical pastoral education or CPE, I felt like I kind of had this caregiving thing down okay. I mean, I had graduated from Baylor in social work. I had done two years part-time already as a chaplain while in seminary. And so by the time I got to my residency, I kind of thought I knew a thing or two. Well, I did until probably maybe my second meeting with my supervisor when I brought a visit uh, that I had had with a patient that I actually thought was pretty decent, pastoral care. And um, about halfway through our conversation about this visit, he stops and says, um, 
I'm, I'm just wondering um, who need, whose needs were you meeting here because um, I don't think it was the patients. Yikes. Oh, big ouch. That patient who I was visiting with was very concerned about her illness and about dying. And in that time that I spent with her, earnestly wanting to help, I worked hard on trying to encourage her to eat and focus on all the reasons why she had to work hard to get better. I thought I needed to help and provide hope by pulling her out of the emotional well and helping fix what in reality couldn't be fixed. I remember that visit because it opened my eyes to a whole nother perspective that hope was not in my reaching down from above trying to pull her out of that well, but hope was to be found in the relationship, in me being with her and listening deeply to the pain that she was feeling and abiding with her in love in the midst of that pain. It was a huge shift in perspective for me that has continued to shape my ministry because it meant giving up or loving less my place of safety as a helper who stood outside the pain to becoming vulnerable and enter into a relationship of mutuality and love that abides with another in the valley of the shadow of death. In some very real ways, that supervisor was calling me to repentance and to a change or shift in perspective that led to change behaviors. Thank God. John the Baptist's call to repent for the kingdom of God has come near requires first an inward look at what is my sin in preparing the way for this huge new shift in perspective that is coming. The early Christian theologian and philosopher St. Augustine defined sin in terms of disordered love which he described as failing to love what is to be loved and loving too much what should not be loved or loved less. Being out of balance with what we love. That there is a proper order and priority to what we give our attention to and our love to. In Sunday school, and you may have heard this too, as a kid I was taught correct order of love using the acronym JOY. Jesus, others, you, or me, right? This made sense to me in that I knew I could get a lot out of whack with relationships, but I couldn't connect so well to this hierarchy of one above the other or not, and was if I loved others and Jesus, was there room left for me or did I have too much? But I was confused just how to live that out. Contemporary theologian Sally McFaig addresses this same idea of sin as disordered loves, but in a non-hierarchical holistic context. What she says, using the metaphor of God as love or lover, is that God who created this world and called it good is the lover of all the world. And in this context of God as lover, Sin is the refusal by us to be the beloved and the refusal by us to love all that God loves. It is all about the refusal of relationships. And so the healing and the work of salvation in this context and in this view is making manifest God's great love for all the world which includes us. This new thinking or changing of our minds that preparing the way, though must first begin with the vision that all of us are loved by God with the most extravagant love we can imagine. The love that loves us not in spite of who we are, but because of who we are. And it is through this awareness of God's tremendous love for us that a redirection from the paradigm of myself and my own perspective as central toward one that includes all of the world, including myself. This new orientation is about waking up to acknowledge the radical relationality and interdependence of all God's beloved with one another. 
from this perspective of being loved, that love overflows and we are energized to bear fruits worthy of repentance, to overcome alienation, to heal wounds, to include the outcast, to stand up against systemic structures of oppression based on race, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, and ethnicity. And indeed, this radical relationality on some level was demonstrated in jo John, the Baptist, call to repent and be baptized in that the call was for everyone, Jews as well as Gentiles, the whole community. Typically at that time, baptism was a ritual of conversion for Gentiles becoming Jews. But John's call in anticipation to be transformed is to everyone. And he meant transformation as from the inside, not just from entitlement, as he says to the Sad Pharisees and Sadducees, <clears throat> but change that results in bearing fruits worthy of repentance. The Gospel writer Matthew tends to keep this description that we heard from Griff about John the Baptist rather short and to the point. But Luke expands on the story a little more by giving us some insight into the dialogue that might have happened between John and the crowd. When he talked about bearing fruit worthy of repentance, the crowd, and I'm really glad they were kind of, because I would kind of feel this way too, they were asking, well, you know, what does this mean? They were asking for some clarification. And so in Luke chapter 3, they ask, what then should we do? Well, John says to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. John's, these directions to this crowd from John actually reminded me of the contemporary writers of a teacher from the business world who is proposing some radical changes to leaders throughout the world today. Dr. Otto Scharmer is a professor at MIT, an innovator in this, what I talked about before, awareness-based systems change, and is the author of the book Leading from the Emerging Future. In his book, he talks about what is needed in our world is a shift from ecosystem awareness to ecosystem awareness. He explains that the prefix eco, going back to the Greek, means whole house. And the word economy can be traced back to the same root. Transforming our current ecosystem economy into an emerging ecosystem economy means reconnecting economic thinking with its real root, which is the well-being of the whole house rather than money-making or attention to the well-being of just a few of its inhabitants. The whole house in our world today means concerns for the well-being of our global communities and villages and planetary ecosystems. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? If you have two coats, share one with one who has none. And the same with food. Do not extort money, don't overcharge, etc. Sharmer describes that in order for this new paradigm to emerge, it will require us to tap into a deeper level of our humanity, of who we really are and who we want to be as a society. He quotes, it is a future that we can sense, feel, and actualize by shifting the inner place from which we operate. Repent. Be transformed from the inside out. From an ecosystem awareness that cares about the well-being of oneself, and that perspective to an ecosystem awareness that cares about the well-being of all God's word, including oneself. So, as a community of faith, as a community of the beloved, 
How do we, individually and together, live out and make manifest the vision of radical relationality and interdependence with all God's beloved? It starts with the contemplative mind and action. Being still, going inward, paying attention to what is there, listening deeply, being still. Sharmer talks about opening the mind, the heart, and the will by suspending old habits of judgment, empathizing with one another, and letting go of what wants to die in oneself and letting come what is waiting to be born. Perhaps this is what Jesus can help us with as the one who can separate out the wheat from the chaff, what needs to be let go of, what needs to be born. When I was that very novice young chaplain working so hard and to be a good, good minister and needing to be needed, I learned through reflection in my quiet spaces that a big part of my needing to help fix what was unfixable for my patients was and often still is connected to my own wounds and not allowing myself to live into my own belovedness in God. What is it this Advent that is calling to you to attend to in yourself? How are you being beloved by God? In Paul's letter to the Romans that Louisa read earlier, he shows us that it takes the whole community working together to show itself to be a reflection of Christ. Romans in verse 5, May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. This community of First Austin has been intentional about expanding our welcome and we have been enriched and enlivened as a result. We need to continue to seek out perspectives that are different from our own. Sharmer says that the journey from ecosystem to ecosystem awareness involves exploring the edges of the system and the self. Exploring the edges of the system means going to the place of the most potential, walking in the shoes of the marginalized, he says that in his research, he's actually found that the new in any system often shows up first at the periphery. Perhaps that is why John the Baptist preached in the wilderness on the periphery where something new was about to happen. Paul's blessing is that the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony. Steadfastness can indeed go a long way in promoting harmony. I appreciate the Benedictine monk Father Lawrence Freeman's how he describes faith in terms of the community of faith and that he says that is being our capacity for relationship, for enduring, transcending the instinct to run away and have an easier time somewhere else. It is abiding with one another in the midst of the joy, the pain, the grief, the celebration, and the times of loss. It is being attentive to and waking up during a season that is filled with advertisements of joyful, happy people to those who are suffering and grieving and struggling amongst us. To not need, as I did as a novice chaplain, for the one next to me to be in a different place from where they are, but instead to be with them in the midst of that dark place. That is indeed where hope is. How are we awake to each other and to welcoming all of who we are to one another? Not just the happy or the okay parts, but all of who we are. As we go from this place today to do this work of repentance, I'd like to conclude by offering you some words from the author Clarissa Pinkola Estes, who you may have known a while back, wrote Women Who Run With Wolves. She's a, 
an Jungian analyst and poet, and she wrote these beautiful words in a letter after the election season. Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once, but stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small, calm thing that one soul can do to help another, to assist some portion of this suffering world, will help immensely. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip toward an enduring good. What is needed for dramatic change is an accumulation of acts, adding, adding to, adding more, continuing. We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small, determined group who will not give up during the first, second, or hundredth gale. One of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Soul on deck shines like gold in dark times. The light of the soul throws sparks, can send up flares, build signal fires, causes proper matters to catch fire. To display the lantern of the soul in shadowy times like these, to be fierce and show mercy toward others, both are acts of immense bravery and greatest necessity. Beautiful words indeed. May each of you be reminded in the depths of your soul during this Advent season that you are loved deeply and passionately by the power whose love pulses through the universe. Amen. <laughs>